At this time, I'll call the uh, monthly Board of Commissioners meeting to order, and I'll ask that you stand as we do the invocation and the pledge. <coughs> Commissioner, let us pray. <laughs> Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful and thankful for this very moment in time, and God, we pause to give respect to those in Las Vegas, all who are suffering all those who have passed and for the tragedies all over this world as well as these United States. Now Father we say thank you for things being as well as they are and Father we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would allow your peace to rest in this meeting as we do the business of your people. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 Commissioner Richardson. Aye. 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 Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioner uh, Langley, I apologize. Your name all of a sudden just... That's fine. I was having one of those senior minutes. <laughs> okay, we're down to uh, the conflict of interest. Uh, does any commissioner have any conflict that they would like to disclose at this time? Hearing none, we'll move to item number D, the approval of the agenda. So move. Got, a, got a motion. And Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'd like to add, we need to, I think, have a word or two about the, the military air rights because they're beginning to return again. Just to let people know that there are meetings going on involving this. Okay. Unless there's objection. We'll move that to item number 21. And there is a public hearing, go not a public hearing, but there is a informational meeting going on tonight here in Washington. There's one tomorrow night in Columbia, uh, North Carolina. Okay. Any other changes? Mr. Waters, uh, I would like to move uh, or for you to consider moving the uh, under items for discussion, the first one property sale 1240 Cal Farm Road to move that uh, down uh, to items for decisions uh, for decision which would be 22 if you would. I have an offer on that property that I got about an hour and a half ago okay uh, we'll do that <clears throat> mr. chairman yes I ha have an item I'd like to remove all right the one having to do with uh, with uh, what number is that? Con uh, concealed carry? I'd like to remove that tonight and bring it back later. Okay, that's 13. Pardon? 13. Number 13. Okay. Yeah. So we're moving item number one to item number 22. We're adding uh, 21 concerning the uh, U.S. Air Force or the military air rights, and we're eliminating the item number 13. Any other comments, changes? Would the, could we have the motion to approve the agenda? Yes. All right. I, I, will, I will make a motion to approve the agenda, amended agenda. Okay. Commissioner. Second. Uh, okay, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All right. Agenda's approved. Uh, we're down to the public hearing, and I think we have one person that's registered, and I believe that's uh, Ms. Emma Howard. I told you. Just a reminder, uh, we have a three-minute limitation. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Ms. What was Emma? Yes. We need to go, we need to go into... No, this... Oh, you're just doing public. You're just doing public comments. Okay. Not CDBG grant. No. Doing public no. comments. All right. Since you're out there, we're going to go ahead and Thank you. go ahead and do that. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Emma W. Howard, and I have a house in the town of Belhaven. Address 
465 West Pentagon Street. And the house is not occupied. I was devastated when I received my tax statement that I was charged $145 for solid waste. I feel that it's very, very unfair for me to have to pay that fee for a house that no one lives in. I am very concerned about the matter. I'm a senior citizen and on a fixed income. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Did, did you have anyone else on the public comments? Okay. Okay, we'll get back. Uh, we technically just a little bit See what the official time is. Five forty. That one back there says five forty. Does anybody else have a better time? I have five thirty-seven. Five thirty-seven. Five thirty-seven. That's what I got. Are we supposed to wait till the five forty time? Yep. Depends on how it was advertised. Okay. So, was it advertised at 5.30? Go for it. Okay, well, uh, Dan, why don't you step up there and we, we need a motion to go into the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Ben Rogers. I'm a planner with the Mid-East Commission here in um, Washington. The Mid-East Commission is going to be assisting the county with the CDBG, um, that's Community Development Block Grant, if you're not familiar, application that's due on October 20th. Part of that process requires two public hearings. This being our first of the two public hearings, um, there's some information that's required to be presented before the public hearing and take any comment if there are any. So um, I'm just going to read this, um, read this information for you guys. Um, again, the purpose of this hearing is to explain the CDBG program. The second one that will be held on October 19th at 3 o'clock um, will be more project specific. So this one's kind of general information regarding the CDBG program. Um, there are a number of different types of funds available through the CDBG program. Um, the first one's the CDBG infrastructure grants for public water and wastewater infrastructure. In 2013, the North Carolina General Assembly allocated CDBG funds to the infrastructure program and transferred funds to the Division of Water Infrastructure to the Administrator. This temporarily ended the housing rehabilitation program portion of the CDBG program. However, the legislature has once, legislature has once again decided, decided to bring back funds for the housing program. The second type is the economic development funds. These, are, uh, these provide grants to local governments that partner with a pro, uh, pro profit business to bring public infrastructure improvements and or building renovation services. The third one is the CDBG de demolition grants. Um, the goal of this is for prevention or elimination of urban blight. The fourth is the CDBG downtown redevelopment fund. This is designed for infrastructure upgrades of downtown buildings in order to meet current code requirements. And then the final type is the CDBG grant is for disaster recovery, which is what the county is going to be applying for later this month. Um, again, Beaufort County intends to submit an application for up to $1 million, which may include up to 5% for program management to complete the activities pursuant to recovery from damage resulting from Hurricane Matthew. The applications may include single family homeowner rehabilitation and reconstruction, mobile home repair or replacement, acquisition for development of affordable housing, temporary rental assistance, flood insurance assistance, community recovery activities, or infrastructure in support of community recovery plans. Um, all activities must address the federal national objective of low to moderate income benefit or urgent need. The program, uh, the proposed program will not involuntarily displace or temporarily relocate individuals as a result of the program. 
and the public is encouraged to attend public hearings and provide any comment on proposed and past uses of CDBG funds in the county. Again, this is just general information. Um, the second public hearing that's requ required will be more project specific. The application is due on October 20th. That um, second public hearing will be on Thursday, October 19th at 3 o'clock. And we'll get into more detail then with what that application, um, the, the county's plans for this application. So that's the information for this. And again, we'll get more specific at the next public hearing. Okay, at this time, uh, the floor is open for anybody that would like to make a public comment as it relates to the uh, community block grant. anyone like to sing we're going to open it for one minute make sure nobody Myra would you would you ask if there's anyone out there I think they can hear over the light speaker system Do you know what there's only one gentleman and he said that <laughs> thank you very much Seems like a long minute. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. We need a motion to come out of the uh, public hearing. So moved. Got a motion and a second. Is there was there a second? Second, all those in favor of coming out, raise your hand. Okay. The next item is uh, the public hearing on the solar farm uh, moratorium. And I uh, need a motion to go in to. Got a motion? Second. second. A motion and a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All right. Uh, David, do you want to lead us off into the uh, public hearing? Yes, sir. Uh, at our last meeting on September the 5th, 2017, um, the, uh, you, the commissioners, uh, passed an ordinance imposing a moratorium on the acceptance, processing, and consideration of applications for solar arrays or solar farms pursuant to NC General Statute Section 153A, 340, Parent 8. Um, that, moratorium uh, was uh, to uh, it was anticipated that a minimum of 365 days or one year would be required to complete the process uh, so that it is a uh, would be a one-year situation uh, because it was longer than uh, 60 days uh, we are required to have two public hearings um, and the next public hearing would be uh, I assume at our next meeting uh, which uh, which would be uh, in uh, November so um, we're here tonight to see whether there are any public comments about the moratorium I have uh, two on the list uh, the first one is uh, Mara Beasley and remind you we are holding those to three minutes first I'd like to thank you for the proposed um, solo moratorium voted to be put in place last month I'm speaking tonight on behalf of our group and others in Beaufort County who want to see a moratorium in place with acceptable ordinances and setbacks implemented. We know the process is going to be long and arduous, and we thank you for your commitment to this. Invenergy stated at a public meeting last month that solar panels will be placed across um, various field ditches that will be cleared out by shovel. This statement um, seemed ridiculous to me, knowing how much modern equipment we have, but it would be like holding tonight's meeting outside in a tent with lanterns. Environmental issues that will change the landscape as a whole and increase drainage problems many communities are already faced with 
need to be resolved up front. Now is not the time to rubber stamp anything until it has been reviewed by the Soil and Water Conservation and other environmental regulators. You have the ability to speak with existing landowners that are now beside current solar facilities in our county, and I would ask that you interview those people. Um, I have had individuals tell me that because of the panels going across the ditches and not being cleared out, that there has been water puddling on roads, and then they have also had um, overflow of drainage in their area. So now is an opportunity, I feel like, that you can speak with your neighbors. A large amount of tax revenue is at stake, and how that shortfall is going to be made up needs to be determined beforehand. We are not willing to bear the tax burden of lost agricultural jobs or tax revenue loss from taking farmland out of production. I respect your decision of, to put the moratorium in place, and I thank you for going ahead and setting another public hearing date. We absolutely understand that many hours of testimony and research are required to develop beneficial ordinances for all parties involved. I would also like to thank the citizens of Beaufort County who have actively taken part in the interest of this county and this county's future, and the media for informing the public in regards to the solar moratorium and ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Beasley. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank you for opening the meeting with prayer. I believe this is an aspect that makes Beaufort County such a great place to live. And it seems to me as you do the work of the people, you are dedicated to protecting the people of Beaufort County and especially those providing Christian education. And I also want to thank you for the moratorium that you've put in place, but I encourage you to do more. I have an article, and it is from the Delmarva Farmer. It's an editorial. It's an agribusiness newspaper in Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And the title of it is Solar Reps Flying Under Radar. It's talks of the pros prospect of solar development gobbling up the eastern shore farmland. It speaks of the Richfield Solar Project, and it says it it's, um, was filed by a company called Invenergy, based in, for, in Chicago. It goes on to say that the company did not hold a community outreach meeting, did not hold a community outreach meeting, and the adjacent landowners were informed of the project when they re received a letter from the County Planning and Zoning Commission advising them of the Board of Appeals hearing within a few days. Seems like a very similar scenario to what Invenergy has come and done here. You know, they fly under the radar and then all of a sudden pop up when I have all their ducks in a row, leaving the communities that they're coming to be good neighbors in scrambling. So um, I feel like as representatives and and, and community members that this is not a rep a company that we want to you know move into our county and that we want to be neighbors with and I uh, don't understand how we can be good neighbors with people like that so I just want you to please consider um, all those things at hand thank you thank you is there anyone else that would like to speak during the public hearing If no one else would like to speak, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the public hearing. So moved. Got a motion to come out of the close to public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Unanimous. Thank you. We're down to uh, item number G. Item. Items for presentation, the Bonner Scholarship Award presentation. Uh, Bob? Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> there, uh, there's a people here that want to speak on an item that's coming up later on in the agenda, and I don't think they're aware that they can speak during the public comments period. If they are, we need to ask again if they want to have an issue that they want to speak on that's going to come up tonight. Otherwise, they won't be able to speak <clears throat> while we're okay. deliberating the issue. Is, is there anyone else? Well, we've closed the, I mean, we've gone past the public uh, comments at this point in time. They can always be reopened. I mean, we're... Is there, any, is there anyone that would like to speak during the public comments? Okay. Does, any, does anybody have any objections to opening? No, no. Okay. Let him talk. Good afternoon, gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, 
appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak here on, tonight. Uh, my name is Burl Brown. I live on, on Hub Direct Road in Bellhaven. I've been living there for 49 years. Um, the property right next to me used to be a little restaurant there, Hub Direct, which has been torn down a long time ago. And some people bought it and had a few sailboats out there. And up until this date, we've got along real well. Well, about two or three months ago, it's supposed to have been sold, and a guy come down from New Jersey, and he's, it was a tiki bar there, a little outdoor bar. And since then, he, he's had several bands over, DJs every Saturday night so forth, and a DJ or a, um, a band. The, no, the county North noise ordinance is supposed to be six. Uh, six decimals from nine o'clock at night till nine o'clock in the morning. The deputy sheriffs have been over and you're about every time. They've been real nice, real professional, but they've had the noise uh, meter there. It's re re you know, all the time it's registered better than six and a half and it has gone up to 7.35. And w I know of two different occasions, they've been over three times. This, they asked them to cut it down they cut the noise down, the sheriff leaves or the deputy leaves. Before they get out the end of the road, it's right back up. This past Saturday night, the same thing. Um, the last two, two songs he played Saturday night at 12 o'clock, I think they were trying to get back at me. You could hear them up here to Washington. Um, I went to church Sunday. I have a, um, people that goes to church where I go. They live out on the main highway is about a mile and a quarter. They said they could hear it out at their house. Across the creek where I live is a mile and a quarter wide. Diagonally across, it's probably a mile and three quarters. On both directions, people have asked me about it. Got another um, era schooner point. People say they hear it all the time, and it's probably three quarters of a mile through the woods. The people, the people that runs it, they're they're asked for. They're trying to get a liquor permit. I reckon if you if you're drunk, it don't matter if you're on liquor or a beer or no matter what you're doing, you're drunk. And they hoop and hollering from 8 o'clock at night to 12, to, or two, sometimes 2. And if you drink from 8 o'clock to 12 or 2 o'clock in the morning, you're driving under the influence. Um, you buy all the residents down my road, or you're all older people, they need to rest, and there's no way in the world you can rest during that. You, you, you sit in your house and you don't have to hear it, you can feel it. The house the vibrations the people has asked I understand they've that they're to come before y'all and ask for where they can do this ever ever Saturday night have a band or band but it's no different than a band or a DJ they stay open every night from 12 I mean or every Saturday night from 12 to 2 o'clock and they hoop in and hollering this is right under my window um, it's not right for the community times up thank you thank you mr. Brand Okay, now we'll go to item number G, the uh, Bonner Scholarship Award presentation. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, appreciate you letting us present tonight. Uh, let me say just a couple of words, uh, The uh, especially for the public, is that the Beaufort County gets their insurance coverage through the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners Risk Management Pools. Excuse and me, this excuse been me our, one second. Yes, <laughs> Can we have that back door closed? Okay, um, and since the early 1980s, this uh, fund has been able to provide valuable risk management services to our member counties across the state. Uh, one of our early trustees uh, for the risk management pools was a gentleman, but I don't need to, I'm sure everybody's heard his name here, and that's Frank Bonner. Um, and Mr. Bonner, we, uh, reading the legacy he left here in Beaufort County, but his legacy has been statewide because soon after his passing and uh, we started a memorial scholarship fund in his name uh, and every year we select a member uh, of our risk management community from across the state uh, that works hard to help prevent accidents from occurring in our member counties to be the recipient of a Frank Bonner scholarship and that pays for them to attend uh, the Public Risk Management Institute this year will be held in San Antonio, Texas, in fact, it was starting Monday. And I'm pleased to announce tonight that your own risk manager, Jennifer Banks, is the 2017 recipient of the Frank Bonner Scholarship. So I'd like to bring her.
we got this nice frame certificate for her, but I think she's probably going to be interested in the, the check that is uh, actually took her back. So. <laughs> okay. And uh, with that, if unless you have any other questions, that uh, concludes our presentation for her. So, thank you, Bob, and uh, congratulations, uh, Jennifer. The next item on our agenda is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and Valerie, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Valerie Kynes. I'm the Executive Director of Roos House, which is Beaufort County's domestic violence shelter. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It is an epidemic affecting individuals, families, and the community, and the consequences can cross generations and last lifetimes. In Beaufort County, Roos House is a faith-based, community-driven, nonprofit organization whose mission is to interrupt the cycle of family violence by providing services for victims, safe shelter, court advocacy, counseling, and community outreach. It also provides a 24-hour crisis line. In 2016, Roos House provided safe haven for 55 women, 37 children, served 16 men, provided court advo advocacy and counseling services to over 541, and responded to 230 crisis calls. As part of its mission to increase awareness of domestic violence and its impact on the community, Roos House presents the following resolution. Whereas approximately one-fourth of women in the United States will experience domestic violence at some point in her life, and whereas domestic violence is one of the most chronically underreported crimes with only approximately one-fourth of all incidents reported to law enforcement, and whereas domestic violence victims experience physical and mental health-related consequences at far greater rates than those who have not been abused, and whereas the economic burden of domestic violence in North Carolina is over $307 million annually in direct medical cost and loss of productivity, and whereas 15.5 million children in the United States live in families where domestic violence occurs, and whereas witnessing violence between parents or caregivers is the strongest risk factor of transmitting violent behavior from one generation to the next, and these children are more likely than other children to die before the age of five, and whereas domestic violence is not limited by gender, age, ethnicity, economic status, education, religion, or sexual orientation, and whereas public awareness has the potential to increase the identification and reporting of domestic abuse and can act as a catalyst to promote education and long-term prevention. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Beaufort County, North Carolina Board of Commissioners hereby observes October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month and urges all citizens of the county to participate in enhancing awareness of the negative impact of domestic violence on children, families, and communities adopted the second day of October 2017. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'd be honored and proud to make a motion to accept this resolution. Okay, Commissioner Brin. Second. Second by Commissioner Bozio. All those in favor of the resolution, raise your right hand. The vote was unanimous. Thank you for what you do. Okay, we're down to the items for consent. Uh, any item that uh, you would like to have removed for further discussion? Motion to approve. Got a motion to approve by second. Commissioner Booth and a second by Commissioner Buzio. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Oh, Unanimous. Excuse me. <laughs> I always vote against this. I, I thought you were going to break your tree. I thought you'd have to change no, your heart. No, no, I, I caught myself. I, I think you actually ought to vlog enough water. that I can. <laughs> You reverse that vote under objection. That's a six, okay. six to one vote. We'll let we'll let the record be six to one. All right, we're down to uh, items for discussion, and we are moving the first item. Uh, we're down to item number two, which is the breakdown of nonprofit solid waste tax billing. Uh, Commissioner Richardson. Oh, okay. We. We started off, this has to do with the billing for trash that the commissioner set up into an enterprise fund, $145 a month that's added to your tax bill. And the first go around on this, we had um, about 400 people were on the list. 
So we went back and did a computer program. I asked for more information. And now we've got about 1,800 people on the list. And when I say on the list, these are started off as being nonprofits because for some reason the county decided that it wouldn't bill nonprofits for trash collection. Well, that's not the way it was done. The commissioners reversed that. Now we have about 1,800 people on the list, and my request is that this list be refined because the list now has questionable items on it of people who uh, probably should be paying. You cannot identify the whole basis for why some are not paying and, and some are paying. And we have things on here like um, sick, infirm, uh, and, and my understanding is that that was put on here because of people who are entitled under the statutes to a lower tax reduction but there's nowhere in there that says you get free trash collection so these people are on the list and they're supposedly paying their 145 dollars but there's a lot of other things on the list that are highly questionable when we supposedly refine the list about half of the categories on here are other uh, some of those others are paying uh, 145 dollar track tax fee or uh, trash fee and some of the others are not paying $145 tax fee. We have cases on here where some municipalities are not paying for some locations. Uh, it's just it's just not the kind of a list that is useful. And what my request was initially and is still a request is that we refine this list so that we have some categories on here Number one, the commissioners need to know, the, at least this commissioner wants to know, the people that were added to the list that were picked up as having to start paying a trash fee. And those that are nonprofits or for whatever reason are not on the list that have trash receptacles and, and generate trash that are not paying trash. Otherwise, there's no control on this. We don't know what we're doing is what it comes down to. Uh, and if someone came in and complained, how would we sort through this 1800 person list? Now, is Bobby here? No. All right, now, I was told by the, by the tax assessor uh, a month or so ago when this started that we had asked our tax people to write a program to take care of this that would sort through our tax records and come up with, uh, at that time, two lists. One, the new people who are paying, and two, the people that are not paying. Who, who, are, who look like they perhaps could be paying. Nonprofits or whatever you want to call them. And nonprofits have been categorized as state offices, uh, some individuals, uh, uh, some county offices, which we wouldn't charge ourselves, but some municipal offices. So I, as a commissioner, am just not satisfied that we're doing a good job in knowing who and why we're charging this to. And my question to the commissioners is, if we paid somebody to do a, a computer program to sort this, why all of a sudden has the list grown from 400 to 1,800? This, this thing needs to be refined so you can pick up the list and, and tell what you're doing and, and screen it to see maybe if, if there are people on the non-pay list that perhaps should be paying. Uh, Brian, have you had any conversation with uh, Bobby? I have, and, and, and Commissioner Richardson and I talked a little bit briefly before uh, the meeting. The layout that you had in regards to the list that, that uh, Mr. Parker provided, there's a column in there that talks about other and sick and affirmed and uh, municipal or county. Um, those are actually, like Commissioner Richardson said, they're actually tax-related, not solid waste-related. Um, I'm not sure why that actually got on the sheet. Part of the reason Mr. Parker explained to me was that there are a lot of others in there is that the Farragut system diver d defaults to other in the category. So if you are eligible for the elderly exemption under your tax rate, which the state allows, then they would plug in that code, aged and affirmed. Um, there are a couple of others. There's the circuit breaker. There's... Um, veterans there, there are certain things that allow you to have an exemption on your taxes uh, for certain things um, like mr. Richardson said it's not for utility utilities however um, so I'm not really sure why that's on there but what, what mr. Parker said was when the system brought over when we when we went from Keystone to Farragut when it brought it over Keystone defaults to other so any 
any entity in that list that was exempt by either being a county government because we don't pay taxes or a city government that doesn't pay taxes or someone who had one of those exemptions in some cases it pulled it over and in other cases it just defaulted to other um, so we can certainly work on that I think they're working on that as they go through the list um, this board several meetings ago voted to clarify that language in that every improved parcel now that doesn't include vacant land every improved parcel in Beaufort County um, would be charged the solid waste fee because the county pays for all solid waste disposal again some folks will say well I pay the city because they pick up my trash and that's true but you are paying the city or the provider simply the labor to pick it up when they transfer that to the transfer station, when they take that to the transfer station, the county is paying the tipping fees. And that is how you recover the cost of the tipping fees in the convenience sites is through this fee that's charged to everyone throughout the county. Um, so anyone who has an improved property is charged that unless you have a contracted pickup service that pays the full rate if it's a commercial service like businesses and industries have a commercial service that picks it up and they pay the entire amount so you can come in and say here my here's my paperwork um, I do pay the full amount my tip and fees are being paid in my bill and then mr. Parker will reverse that out um, this is a new process for us so essentially we build everybody and then there's an obligation for folks to come in and show us that no I have this and and I shouldn't be charged um, one of the questions that you heard tonight was uh, from Ms. Howard was I have a piece of property and I have a house on it um, the consideration that the tax office is looking at is is that piece of property could that piece of property be lived in could somebody could you rent that property if it's not a livable structure then they would look at that and say if it's not livable then we would not charge you because nobody would be there generating solid waste um, so that's the opportunity to clear that as well but but that's kind of where that is and and we'll continue to work with mr. Parker on, on well that. yeah and the problem I have with it is if I can't look at the list and tell why you're not paying your solid waste fee I mean I just want fairness out of this then how can the tax office look at it and tell you why you're not paying your solid waste fee and you can say well I got a lot more data and information well all that's public information why can't it be presented in a form that's understandable to everybody so, you know, we may be still losing a lot of money in this thing, as far as we know. And, you know, I, I, they, he did send bills to everybody that he thought should be paying it. But if you look at this list with 1,800 names on it, you probably got 1,200 names on here that are paying zero. Right. And, and some of those don't like, and some of them should. Yeah. Like, like, um, like even some of our properties where we don't like, in, in our complex right here, we don't pay because we have a dumpster and, and we pay the full cost on a dumpster but we have satellite facilities that we ha that we own that the county owns that we will pay that fee because the county's not exempt from that fee either oh really okay because it is a solid waste fee that that funds the solid waste fund I got you. Um, and that's why you'll see some of the cities the city stuff on there they're exempt because they have there's Miss Parker um, they have dumpsters or in some facilities they may not have a dumpster so anybody who doesn't have a dumpster or a commercial pickup is charged that regardless of 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 their tax status whether they're a nonprofit, whether they pay county taxes, again, it goes back to its utility. You don't get free water because you're a nonprofit. You don't get free electricity. You don't get free garbage pickup as well. So, Chairman. Yes. Brian, uh, what companies do we have here in Buffer County that, that pick up and pay their own uh, tipping fee? Um, uh, let's, let's see. Paperback. You've got Packer, Packer, Packer David's. Uh, David's. David's. Now, David's has some commercial, but David also mm -hmm. picks up residential. <laughs> On the residential side, we're paying that tip of fee. So any residential that's picked up. So any, any franchised group that's picking up business or commercial trash is paying the full ride. Um, Mr. Parker, do you know of any others that, that we've missed? I think you were covering them pretty much. Okay. SDR, SDR. Right. Well, what what do, my question is: What do we need to do to get this into a more refined list with better explanations for why people aren't paying? I, I think from and not to speak for Mr. Parker, but I think from 
from what we will know as we get through this first billing cycle, we will have a we'll be able to generate for you a list of people who have or of entities that have shown us that they have a business relationship with a contract hauler who is paying the full price. Otherwise, everybody pays. So the, the list we would generate would be from that. I think we brought this up that it's not going to be perfect the first year. But when we come back and see all the ones we release, all the ones after this, we're going to make pretty close next year a pretty close list that it's what's correct. And we're still going to have some stragglers. We've always had stragglers side of place. But I think it will be that is the year right next year, but we'll spend a lot of time this year going back and looking at the dumpsters that people say they have dumpsters. They might not have the dumpsters. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Commissioner B. Uh, uh, Mr. Parker, person, person that has that private uh, pickup, do they need to contact you to get, get off of that list that uh, that for the $145? If you have a uh, house and you have a business that is not uh, being solid waste and it's just picked up by David and Associates or whatever company they come around to pick it up, you need to pay that solid waste. Bill, you if David, you said if Dave, if a private vendor pick it up, then the residents still owe the hundred and forty-five dollars right. tipping fee. Churches, businesses. Uh, now, if uh, some of churches have been doing this since they have been doing this for years, and they have been doing it for years, so you're releasing those. You're releasing those. But if you don't, but okay, but if you're private, if, if, for example, if I live on Jones Road and, and I got Parker's picking up my my garbage, I still had to pay that 140. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Evans. Uh, down where I'm on River Road, same thing. I I pay Davis to pick up my trash, but I'm still going to the dump, and I got to care branches and different things like that. So you still pay a solid waste. I do. Well, can we print out a list of those that are exempted? I, I will speak if I can narrow it down to just the ones that are exempted. I mean, we paid all this money for this computer system. It's got to be able to do something. I mean, we just paid three quarters of a million dollars. You're absolutely right. Well, I, I had a chance to talk with uh, Wynn a little bit this afternoon before the meeting. He was in here, and Wynn says that we already have people that are asking how to get it sent. So the list is really not going to be good until probably December the 31st because I'm assuming each one of those are going to try to get it in before the end of the year. We have a lot of people ask for it, and we go out and look, and they do not have a dumpster. They need to pay, they're living in the house, they need to pay $145, and that's what we're doing. Uh, I think that is the way we want to be consistent, is to go out and look for it if we have any questions. But, but there still should be a list from the billing. I mean, we've done a tax billing. There should be a list from the present tax billing of people that are exempted. Well, what you gave us at the last meeting is the total. Uh, that's the reason we have 1,800. What, what I'm talking about is that, is that the people now are coming in asking for the exemption, and they're having to follow up. This is what we build. Okay. Yeah, but next year we'll get another list. I want this year's list. Of exemptions. There's got to be a list of exemptions. You've done a tax billing. How did you do the tax billing? How did how did you know who to exempt? A list of exemptions, but we were looking for exemptions that would still have to have the solid waste on it. We can give you a list of exemptions, but it will not show the solid waste on it. You've got a list of exemptions in here. We got but a list of exempt from solid waste, right? We can give you a list of exempt from solid waste that are exemptions. Exemptions exempt from solid waste. That's yeah. what you're asking. That's one of the things that I want. That may not be all I want, but that's, that's the first thing I want. I, I don't have my list with me, but if I remember correctly, do you have zeros in the yeah. in the last column on some? If there's a zero, does that mean they're exempt? That's correct. Okay. 
But you got a category on here. This has been categorized as other. Other. And when you go down this list, there's about 1,200 names on there that are other. What is other? Is your other the same as his other? I, I think, again, Stick let's, let's, don't, let's don't mix our norm, nomenclature. The, the exemption, when you say exemption, what we think about is an exemption from tax status. So you may be exempt from a portion of your taxes because you're a senior citizen, you meet the, you meet the, eight, the age and income requirements, or you may be exempt from a portion of your property taxes because you're a veteran, a disabled veteran, or, or, or a part of the circuit breaker or something like that. Uh, exemptions don't apply we just have to be careful when we say exemptions. when you say exemptions he's going to give you the exemption no I'm, I'm referring to exemptions from the from paying the hundred and forty five dollars paying the 145 and anybody yeah. who's not paying the 145 is someone who has a commercial pickup that is paying the full freight well, there's about 12 of them here 100 of them then here then on this list I mean that's I, th I don't think there's that many. Well, I was going to ask is that you clarified it is that when we say exemption, we could be talking about taxes. We're not necessarily talking about the 145 waste fees. So you got I agree with you. You've got to be very careful how you explain and ask the questions. It's one thing. But you could be, you'd be exempt from taxes, but you're still paying a waste fee because you don't have a commercial pickup where they're paying the tipping fee. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Brand. I have a question for Bobby. If, if a person owns a house and he rents it three months out of the year and it stays vacant for the rest of the year, nine months, how does that work as far the as? The house is livable, and I believe you got, the commissioner said if it's a livable property, we charge them $145. Okay. Even though there's nobody living there? Well, nobody has to live there. It's a local house. It's got water. It's got uh, power. But there's nobody. There's nobody there that's creating solid waste. Because it's a livable property, it can be rented any time during the year. Okay. That, that's been back. That started with 1993. If it's got improvements on the property. No land is. Any anything else? Before we move to the next no, item. No, we get that list. We'll be good. Okay. Uh, we're, item number three is the Finance Committee update, and that's you, I assume, and Brian. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll handle that night. Just to let you know, uh, Anita's not playing hooky. She actually, uh, Friday or Thursday night, actually fell at her house and uh, hit her head. And, and uh, so she's essentially under concussion protocol. Um, her doctor has her out until for two more days. So. <clears throat> But she's doing okay, just just a little dizzy, and but so she's not in today. Um, so to give you an update on the finance committee report. Um, as you recall, uh, we have a, a finance committee meeting, and and after that finance committee meeting, we always give an update to the board, to the full board, about what went on. So from that meeting on September the nineteenth, um, there were, we talked about the sales tax audit. You'll recall that there's a sales tax audit that we're under by the state. Uh, they're they're doing that across the state, and not only with public entities but with private entities as well. The gentleman who was scheduled to come down and do our sales tax audit actually was involved in a car accident in Beaufort County. Um, was transported to the hospital and had some some injuries. Um, so he will it will be a while before he's is back. So. Um, that that project is uh, is ongoing. Uh, Mr. Jeff Best, who is the I'm I'm getting some feedback, and I ask that you be patient and listen. Uh, Mr. Jeff Best, who is who is the principal of the auditing firm that's currently doing our 1617 audit, gave an update to the finance committee uh, about where they were. Again, they uh, they are moving forward with that audit and doing what they are required to do. They are still waiting on the, the numbers from the state of North Carolina. That always holds us up a little bit um, because we have to get numbers from the state. They're the only ones who can get us on DSS and the health department on, on those numbers. So um, we also gave an he also gave an update or we gave an update on the 2008 Geo School Bond closeout. You'll recall we re this board refinanced some some school bonds. Um, just updated the, the committee on that as, as um, uh, Davenport did that for us, Davenport Financial did that for us. They gave us an estimate at the time it came before this board uh, of 
thousand dollars in savings over the life of those bonds when the actual closing occurred and all the bonds were sold it was actually one hundred and forty thousand one hundred forty nine dollars so there was a delta of three hundred dollars so they were uh, they were right on where they needed to be uh, so that was an update there was also an update on the county services transitioning where we're moving our banking services uh, to first national bank that's probably gonna be a six to nine month process as we go through that but the community was updated on that we also updated the committee on the borrowing package the 17 18 fiscal year borrowing package um, uh, mr. Atcliffe and I went and met with Tim Rocky several weeks ago he is the the section chief of the of the debt the local debt group for the local government commission uh, we laid out the projects that the board had approved under the financing um, he said essentially that the local government commission um, or that or that local governments across north carolina were financing these kind of projects every day and the local government commission was approving those projects every day um, they understand clearly that these are capital projects they are not ongoing um, um, operating expenses they are capital projects we reviewed all those with them he did indicate that they had received some comments from uh, from some local folks voicing some opposition to that uh, as part of the application process we will get those comments those comments will be given to us we'll be able to reply to those comments um, the question I had to him was it was my understanding that the LGC was the technical branch that looked at uh, financing to make sure that it was statutorily appropriate and that you met all the standards uh, and that was their function and it was not their function to engage in a philosophical debate about how a local board of commissioners paid for projects. And he agreed that that was exactly what the LGC's function was and that local decisions regarding how you deal with your finances, whether you pay cash, whether you finance, or whatever you do is a local decision made by the governing body. Um, the next thing we did was we talked about collateral because we're going in this proposed borrowing package. Um, it is a asset asset collateral such that you're pledging the asset uh, not the borrowing cap not the borrowing power or taxing authority of the of the board um, so we talked about that collateral and we talked about reimbursable projects there was a reimbursement resolution that was passed by this board that essentially allows us to move forward with some of those projects and then reimburse ourselves once the financing comes through um, we have said from the beginning that we're not going to get too far out on a limb and we were going to bring those back to you for this board to decide how much you wanted to, to do reimbursement financing before you got final approval from LGC which we're anticipating in January you've got two agenda items or you got an agenda item that addresses both of these items on your agenda and we'll get to that a little later um, as also part of, of our normal um, finance committee pieces the, the the commission the committee members reviewed travel expenses and reimbursements they also were given an update on on moody's um, of our uh, of an update um, moody's is one of the financial groups um, that rate entities uh, and we recently got our notice that we had um, that moody's kept us at our double a3 rating um, so we, we we didn't go up we didn't go down um, their uh, their comment was that the credit position for Buffer County is good um, the notable credit factors include a very strong financial position a negligible pension liability and a manageable debt burden um, the credit position reflects a considerable tax base and an adequate socioeconomic profile these are the folks that rate your bonds when you sell them so they've kept us where we kept us where we were before next regular meeting for the Finance Committee is December the 19th um, this year at 3 p.m. Thank you for for that. Any questions from the report? Any any questions of uh, Brian? All right. Item number four is the uh, manager's update. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Just a couple things to give you an update on. Um, you'll see in the in in your agenda there's a note regarding a state auditor's visit. So I want to just kind of give you that timeline and and, and talk to you about that. Uh, on August the 3rd, I received a request from the State Auditor's Office for copies of the closing statements, appraisals, deeds, and other related documents regarding the purchase of the Wrights Creek Phase II property and the Beaufort County Community College Public Safety Complex property purchase. The auditor, the State Auditor stated that they had received an anonymous complaint on the state hotline regarding these purchases. He also stated that they had received a similar complaint about the Motorola radio project but already had a copy of that contract. 
On August the 23rd and the 24th, Mr. Barry Long, who is the supervisor of the Special Investigations Unit of the State Auditor's Office, and another auditor visited to individually interview each commissioner, Vic Williams, and myself. The county attorney and I met with the auditors before my interview, and, and although they declined to provide specifics, they indicated that they were investigating complaints received through the state hotline generally regarding the purchase of the Wrights Creek Phase II property, the Beaufort County Community College Public Safety Complex property, the Motorola Radio Project, and the Sheriff's Office Drug Buy Fund. On September the 18th and the 19th, Mr. Long and another auditor returned to interview the Sheriff's Office staff regarding the Drug Buy Fund. And on the afternoon of the 19th, Mr. Long met with the Chairman, with, met with Chairman Waters and, my, and myself for a wrap-up of their work. Mr. Long stated that he and his staff had investigated all the allegations made and their investigation was unable to substantiate any of the allegations. He stated that he considered the investigation closed. He further stated that they would not be issuing an investigative findings report since they only issue a report when allegations are substantiated. So I wanted to present that to you. Um, and answer any questions the board may have. Any any questions from the commissioners as it relates to the uh, exit interview that we had? Okay, you want to go to item number two under your update? Yes, sir. Just give you a, a quick update on that. We've got some customer service uh, training scheduled with our staff. Uh, we're doing about we're going to do about seventy-five folks. On, on some customer service training that will be October the 20th and the 24th and the 27th. Uh, we'll break that down. And then there's some strategic planning that the folks in NC State are going to help us with. Um, that's on November the 7th. We certainly encourage the board if you'd like to participate in that. The department heads will be participating in that process. Essentially what that does is we'll go through the process of establishing um, mission, vision, and core values. Um, so we'd love for you to participate in that if you would. Um, that's going to be on November the 7th. It'll be an all-day process. We'll be out at the community college doing that. Um, but what it does is it helps us talk about and, and define what our mission, what our goals, and what our core values are. So when we have folks making decisions, um, you know, you look at the chart, you, you look at that thing hanging on the wall, and it says these are our core values. This is what we believe, and this is how we make our decisions. So, October the 7th, you said? November the 7th. November the 7th. Yes. What, what's the time at the college? Uh, we're start. I think they're going to start at 8.30 and run to 5. You know which building? Not yet. No, sir. We'll be glad to put that out. Um, Okay. And then one, one final thing I do have for you. I was having this conversation uh, with Dr. Phipps today. Um, you, you may recall there is um, recently the General Assembly, or in the last session, the General Assembly put out some funding for what they call the Needs-Based Public School Capital Fund. Um, it was established by Session Law 2017-57, Section 5.3. And what it does is it is put $30 million in available funding this fiscal year with a maximum award of $15 million for any entity for new capital projects. These are only Tier 1 counties that are eligible to apply for this. It has to be new capital projects, which is defined as new facility construction, major facility renovation, or facility rehabilitation. Um, and only projects that address critical deficiencies will be considered. Um, the, the application deadline on this is pretty short time frame. It's, it's uh, October the 11th. Um, there is a matching requirement on this, uh, $1 in local funds for every $3 in grant funds, so it's a twenty-five seventy-five match. Uh, one of the things that we are working through right now, Dr. Phipps says they, they've, discussed, um, they've discussed some projects that may be eligible for it. Um, one of the concerns we have right now is that there's a note on this, that, and we haven't been able to get clar clarification from DPI. It, it's, uh, it's extremely difficult to get to talk to somebody at DPI right now. Um, but they have a note that says if a county receives grant funding awarded from the needs-based public school capital fund, the county will be ineligible to receive allocations from the public school building capital fund, which are allocated during a five-year period beginning with the fiscal year these grants were awarded. So for the next five years, you can't draw down money from that. What, if that's our lottery funds, we don't want to play with this at all. Uh, but we can't get a clear definition from them yet, and we're working on that. Dr. Phipps is working on that. Um, but if this is something that that, uh, that would not impact us on that, it may be something that, that would be worth looking at. Uh, again, there's a very short time frame on it, 
Um, a lot of the tier one counties are not going to be able to put things together fast enough to do this. Um, next year, uh, they are at, there's there's another funding cycle, the same, and it's still tier one counties, but it goes to 75 million, um, same criteria, and then in in 1920, tier two <coughs> tier two counties become eligible for it. Um, so we are looking at that. If 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 there's an opportunity, what we might ask you to do is come back together um, with a with a joint meeting of the school board to talk about those. Um, just not sure where this shakes out yet, but wanted you to know about it. Uh, Commissioner Booth, uh, uh, on the match, do the school board pay that, or do county commissioners pay it? <laughs> uh, you, you, the county commissioners pay for all capital. <laughs> okay. So, so, so what we're saying now, if we if we take this money, then it could affect um, lottery funds. Well, that's what we don't know yet. That okay. that's the question um, because there are two pieces. There's, you know, they they gave us a link on, on the application. There's a link and it says go to this link to see the funds. And when you pull it up, it shows both our old ADM funds. Not average daily membership funds, but but what they the old corporate tax, okay. old corporate tax rate that we used to get. Um, they call them ADM funds, um, and then the lottery proceeds. So it shows both of those on the sheet, and that's what we're trying to get clarification from from DPI about is okay. is, is it just a, and, and you know we've got four thousand dollars left in our in our ADM funding, so we'd be glad to give up that four thousand dollars to get well, me. a million. Yeah. Um, but but we're not willing to do that for five years worth of the four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars worth of lottery funds we draw down. Okay. So um, um, so that's something we've got to clarify before we can even attempt to move forward on something like that. That's what that's where I was headed with. <laughs> how, how many years have you been a commission? Oh, too long. Too long. <laughs> you knew the answer. Yeah. Okay. No, I just wanted to make sure we didn't mess with the uh, lottery. lottery fund. Any any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to clarify All on right. the lottery funds, bro. What are we down to now on lottery funds in percentage? Doesn't that percentage keep dropping? Um, not we're not getting what now. you were promised. Well, no, you're not. No, you're not getting yeah, what you were promised. Not close. <laughs> you're right. Uh, and and you're I don't wrong, know that percentage. Percent. Yeah, I don't know where that percentage <laughs> is off the top of my head. The the real the real sad part about it is, and and it, it you know the the folks at the lottery commission are are not eligible. No. Are not really allowed to say that uh, publicly but first of all when the General Assembly put that in play they said 60 was it 60 percent or 40 percent 40 percent 40 percent uh, was supposed to go to school was no it no it was 60 it was 60 it was, it was, 60. It was, 60. It was yeah. not 40 okay it was 60. so there was a there was a large amount that was supposed to go to dedicated for school capital funding and then they started reducing that. So over the years, they've reduced that. I, I, I'm sorry. In other words, they you. found out how to get their hands on the money. Well, it, not necessarily that. They, they did do that. But also the amount of funds, you would you would assume that when you're bringing new revenue in through, lotter, through the lottery, which was new revenue to the state, that they would take those new funds and they would add it on top of the education money that they were currently giving to education. Well, instead of doing that, they supplanted the funds that they were already given. So they said, well, if we're drawing, say, a million dollars in lottery funds, then we're going to take a million dollars out, put this in here, and we're going to use this million dollars for something else. So they supplanted the funds, and, and that's as clear as it comes. They, uh, they did not add that additional on top to try to better the funding stream for, for public schools. And I think it's important for the residents to know that. It, it, it is, because... Um, because when you say it's an education lottery, it it, um, it really is a good sales gimmick. That's all it is. <laughs> it really is right. <laughs> but but that is something the association of county commissioners continually works on and is continually fighting to try to, to try to get that back the way it should be. Any other discussion? Okay, we'll move into items for decision now. Uh, the first one we have is a noise permit. Uh, Vivian Wolf. Yes, sir. I am trying to get a permit to have entertainment at the Pungo Creek Tiki Bar. It's outside of Bellhaven. Um, we tried to do music every other Saturday night. Um, I have a DJ some Saturday nights, so that's why I'm asking for the permit for every Saturday. Okay. Any any questions? I have. All right. what, is, what is the closest resident 
uh, to your tiki bar? How far is it? Um, I'm not sure how many feet. It's a large yard. It's across the large yard to the back of us. 100 feet, 200 feet? Probably a couple of hundred feet. Mm -hmm. Are there many residents? Residential there are residents? quite a few residents down there, and I have had complaints from one. I noticed that this sheet says incidents of previous noise ordinance citations or complaints. I have not had any citations. You haven't had it, but you've had the sheriff down there several times. Yes. Okay. And I have accommodated them and done what they've asked. Uh, well, were you here earlier for the public comments part? No, sir. Well, that, that we have people who say that you have not accommodated them. Then I would have gotten a citation. No. The sheriff is elected, and he's very reluctant to give right. tickets to people that vote for him. So right. we've had problems with this before. <laughs> yeah. We had a situation down on Highway 17 South uh -huh. that they virtually never gave him a ticket, although there were many, right. many, no, many I mean, complaints. when they've asked for me to turn it down, I have accommodated that. Well, the chief deputy is here, and I really I think we, sh we should hear yeah. from him. I think so, too. Is Charlie? Putting him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Gets the big bucks. <laughs> yes. You sure can. Commissioner Brand's got a question. Um, Sir? Chief, uh, how, how many times have you been, has your people been down to the Tiki Bar in Bell Haven uh, about a noise complaint? There's been nine calls. Nine calls. Uh, with the latest being on the 30th of September and then the first one going back to July 22nd. And the complaint was it wasn't any violence involved in it, just the loud noise? Loud noise. And what did you figure that the noise level was? That that I'm not sure of. Um, there, are, there are documented incidences recently that the guys have gone down there with the noise meter um, and there have been uh, readings that have been taken out um, through one of the complaints. I don't see Mr. Oh, there he is right there. Um, um, one of the complainants that have come that have spoken to me that I believe spoke to a couple of commissioners is that when the sheriff's office would go, sometimes before we even get to the call, then the music will get cut down. And then when the patrol vehicle leaves the area, then they'll cut the music back up. So I think that that, that is part of the deal when it comes to the citations is, is that just like anything else is that we will cite for a violation that we have and that we see in front of us, but we're not going to cite for something when somebody can go and speak to a magistrate and have the charges t taken out on their own. Um, so then the, even that goes back to the, the club back on 17th South where the, the or noise ordinance that we have really was crafted and put into place because of that establishment that, that it puts the it puts us in a situation of what we can and can't cite for and what we can and can write for, which is, which is pretty you know, it's pretty specific mm -hmm. when it comes to what we're going to do and what we're, what we're not going to do. A lot of it has to do with, um, and, and, you know, even for, for any instances, that we've got to have a complainant that is willing to be the number one witness, not a witness alongside of law enforcement, but the witness that goes before the judge to talk about the complaint. And a lot of times when, when noise complaint issues comes up, we just we don't have that. I don't think that this is particularly a case like that, but that is a... a a case when it comes to a lot of the noise ordinance, not that the sheriff is an elected official and we won't write just because of that. I, I, will, I appreciate you clarifying that, Charlie, because I had heard that before. I had forgotten it. Sure. But I know that we've had problems in the past when there were egregious noise things and people weren't charged. Uh, and the, the ordinance is written so that the individual can file those charges himself. That is correct. Uh, it's a misdemeanor level offense. So right. if something happens and, and we can't handle it or do not handle it that night. The way that the complaining party uh, thinks is appropriate, they can speak to a magistrate on their own and take out a misdemeanor level of charge on that. Uh, Charlie, Excuse me, I got one, got one other question. Uh, how many times, you've been down there seven times. Nah, how nah, many nah. times have you got to go down there before you say you just got to shut it down? Well, well you know, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter how many times we respond to a certain call. We've got to have a violation that we can hang our hat on before we're going to affect you know somebody's rights to do whatever they can they can legally do but a lot of this stuff is that uh you know i you know put it everybody does anybody in this room speed 
I'm pretty sure everybody can raise their hand and say, yes, we all speed, but you've got to speed in front of a law enforcement officer to get stopped and cited for that to happen. So, And a lot of times that's, that's the same thing with the noise complaint. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. I'm not really against Ms. Willard having the what she wants, but I think that that she should go back and negotiate with the neighbors and come back to us with something like we've agreed that if this thing is shut down at a certain time at night we've agreed to keep the noise level down we have the neighbors on board I could support something like that but I can't support just out of hand in the face of public complaints well granting this it, it's very unusual for this group to approve this kind of a permit I've been a commissioner for three years and the only permit that we've approved for noise was for one event. It was for like a wedding or for July the 4th or some fireworks. But, I mean, this is asking for Saturday uh, from now until eternity. I mean, this thing does not even have a, a due date on it or a termination date. Oh, well, when and, I filled uh, it out, they told me not to put the dates on, you know, right. just to go for every Saturday. Uh, I've been a commissioner for, for 18 years, so I've, I've, I've seen this, I've seen it, I've seen it, and it's, and it's really bad for those who live where they live. They have no way to go, and so when it starts to booming, the only thing they can do is sit there and listen to it. And so unless y'all come to some uh, agreement, yeah. trust me, I'll never vote for it. I mean, because I understand. I really understand that. Because I know what it's like when the young folk just simply come by with the stereos cranked in their vehicles and they start vibrating everything. So, yeah. And then if you're in your residence and it's just nonstop, that's, well, a, that's asking a bit much. We only go from 8 until t midnight, four hours, every other Saturday night. Uh, Commissioner Brent. Can I ask Mr. Brent a question? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, would, would you be happy if the noise level stayed below six decibels? I think it's 60. 60. Is it 60? 60. 60. 60. I think there's a zero behind that. Because it's a six. I would, <laughs> I would if it's other. It's, it's not just the noise. It's people, they, they get drunk and they're hollering all night. They may have going to 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the law goes over there and asks them to cut it down before they get around the corner, which is a quarter of a mile right back up. They come back one guy, it's twice they've been there three different times the same night. Saturday night, the last time the guy was there, they shut down at 12 o'clock. And they had to cut it down because he's been there three times. And the last two songs they played, you could hear it in Washington. They, they were just getting back to me. That's all it was. No, sir. There's some of the songs are louder with more bass, and it's the bass that they have asked me to turn down. Like Mr. Langer says, when your walls get banging, it's too loud. Okay, we, we're, we're down to the point, unless we get a motion pretty quick from somebody, we're going to end this discussion. Is there a motion Not to approve me. this? No. Uh, I've got a question. I have, an, I, no, have it's to, gonna, it's, it, I, I have to agree with Commissioner Richardson. I think that y'all ought to get together and come to some compromise and bring it back next month, and let's see, see what y'all's compromise is. Okay, I'm willing okay. to do that. Yeah, I'll say one thing. Yes, sir. First time this thing was open, the man, the man that's supposed to be owning it, he had a little trailer backed up right near my property. I stepped over the line and asked him. He said, I can do any damn thing I want to. And that's exact words he told me. Okay, we, we're going to end this discussion. Thank you. And uh, it lies for uh, next month. A lack of a motion. If you guys get together and you come back with something, uh, we'll entertain that at our next meeting. Thank you. All right, we're then to item number two, the schedule evaluation adoption. Uh, Bobby, and if you if you will wait, until this door gets closed. Okay. Wait, just. You freezing? Okay, Bobby. Mr. Commissioners, uh, we've been through the process of our values, schedule of values. Uh, we entered, gave it to you back on the last uh, commissioners' meeting in September. We advertised it twice, and we had a public hearing, as you remember, on the 25th of September. 
We now are here to, I'm now here to, now to ask you to adopt the schedule of values for the 2018 revaluation, which is going on right now. Motion to approve. Okay. Got a motion by Commissioner Langley and a second by Commissioner Booth. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Thank you. Thank you. Bobby. I think everybody's read your textbook. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. We're down to item number four, the request for performance grant. Uh, Mark. And I, and I told you we'd try to get you on before the break. You com <laughs> he complained to me that he always has to show up after the break. So. Oh, geez. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, I've been working with a project called Garden, a New Jersey company that's looking to relocate either to uh, Tennessee or North Carolina. And uh, they've been successful in um, getting the state of North Carolina to, uh, it's not approved, but say that they would be eligible for a 50,000 uh, 1NC grant. Uh, to acquire this grant, they need a one-third match from the local community and uh, the county and the city are the ones that would uh, provide that match. Project Garden Designs manufactures wood, plastic, steel, a multi-material point of purchase displays for Fortune 500 consumer good companies such as retail stores, um, fast food locations, uh, beverage and personal care brands. They also, interestingly, uh, manufacture products for recycling and waste collection equipment, which they sell through a sister company. Currently, as I said, they are researching North Carolina and Tennessee as potential locations, and Washington is the finalist in the um, North Carolina race. Um, they're relocating from New Jersey uh, to be more competitive on a national basis. Uh, the project they plan to invest $1.8 million in facilities and about half a million dollars in equipment over the next three, well, in three years from, say, 2017 to 2019. Uh, when you look at the uh, tax revenue that would be collected over a two-year period, that would be about $9,000. Uh, during the same period, the three-year period, the uh, company plans to employ 52 new, new people, sorry, create. 52 new jobs, an average salary of 33729 and uh, however two of those jobs would be relocated from New Jersey. Um, the average wage rate is slightly lower than the county, average wage rate of $35,474 per annum. However, a lot of these jobs, assembly jobs, are needed in the county for um, the uh, people who earn less income than, than the average. Uh, the performance grant would only be paid after the county has collected uh, the property taxes for the particular year and uh, would not ever exceed the property taxes paid in a particular year. So the request is that uh, you approve uh, the county manager and the county attorney to work with Project Garden to provide a performance grant along with the City of Washington for the 30% match needed for the state of, state of North Carolina $50,000 Project Garden 1NC grant. Do you have any questions? My only question is, is the, is the city going to give up some of their taxes as part of this grant? I've, they meet next, uh, next Monday and uh, it will be Buzz. on that agenda and I currently have, uh, I can't say they will or they won't before they vote, but they are taking it on consideration. Brian. Just one comment. This would have to come back to you with a public hearing under the economic development statutes. We would come back to you if this were formalized. It would come back to you as a board for a public hearing to receive public comment where we lay everything out and then you vote to, to either approve or not approve that. And uh, there is an actual application process for the 1NC grant as well. I got it. This is, this is simply letting us move forward. I mean, if you say right now, no, we don't want to do that, then that's fine. But this lets us move down that process. But again, it will still come back to you under statute with a public hearing. I got a question. Yeah. Is, 
I know the thirty the jobs. You said two of them will be relocated. Right. The rest, the rest, the other thirty-one jobs will be both county or surrounding county residents. Is that right. correct? Yeah. Okay. Another thing is, there any way possible that we could negotiate with these people to bring it up to at least the, our minimum level, thirty-five thousand a year? Right. I mean, we can. I mean, if that that that's not enough, but it's but it's where our baseline is. Is, is that possible? I have uh, pointed that out to them, obviously, mm -hmm. and um, we're in that discussion, yes. I well, think that we, may come back in the future proceedings. Well, seeing that, I, w I will make a motion that we move forward if you need a motion with this project. Yeah, we, we need a motion, but before yeah. you make the motion, let's see if there's an, another question. Yeah. yeah. Most of these positions are just assembly. Right. Uh, right. Yes. Would you? When you say, are you saying thirty percent of the fifty? So we're talking about a total of fifteen between 15 the city. Between the two. Yeah. Okay. Seven, and we normally split it. Yeah. Well, it's based on the tax rates, so it's approximately. I figured that it was like fifty-one point four is yeah. the county yeah. part. Okay. Yes. Is still debating between North Carolina and New Jersey. Um, sorry, that is, that's a typo. Tennessee, <laughs> that is right. a typo. It should say between Tennessee. North Carolina and Tennessee. Tennessee. Okay. It's, it's still debate between North Carolina yes. and Tennessee. Yeah. The maximum rate they would receive would be a third of the $50,000 as match money. Right. That's the yeah. cap. Yes. Okay. However, having said that, if if the 50000 uh, from the state is based on the wage, the average wage rate, if they did bring the average rate, rate back up, that could increase the state. But it's a minimum. It's yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, now we'll take a motion. Did I make a motion that we move forward second. with the process? Second. Okay. Uh, I, I think the second right. came down here. Okay. Commissioner Booth made the motion, and it was seconded by Commissioner Buzzio. All those in. Well, one last chance. Any questions? <laughs> All right. We'll take a vote. All those in favor, proceeding with a grant. Raise your right hand. Vote was unanimous. And uh, let's see. Thank you. Thank All you very right. much. Go get him. I uh, since we're getting into Christina's uh, she's got several items on here we're gonna go ahead and take our 15 minute break and we'll be back at uh, 710 okay we, we'll start back up we're at item number five the utility mutual aid agreement Christina Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, what I've presented to you today is um, our two mutual aid agreements. There are two organizations that are active in North Carolina that facilitate mutual aid agreements between utilities. Uh, in the packet that I've given you, I, I started out um, with a little um, language that says we've all seen photos and videos of electric, cru electric trucks from various electric companies and municipalities lined up to respond quickly to forecasted weather events and we've all seen that on the news. Um, that's because years ago the electrical companies realized the benefits of working together and to, pu and to pull their resources uh, and their equipment in times of need. The utility companies have now done this as well. Um, there are many companies and utilities in North Carolina. North Carolina Water Warren currently has approximately over 90 members and the EWWN has over 56 members. So again, this is something that most utilities have done previously. Um, it has just never been uh, presented to the Board of Commissioners in Beaufort County. I believe that it's a, a good resource for us um, if we were to have a major weather event or any type of uh, major a catastrophe with our utility. <laughs> of course, people in eastern North Carolina are going to help, but what this does is this has something in writing that allows us to track um, via you know, certain accounting techniques and things like that so that we can fall back on the paper trail. Uh, many years ago, as most of you remember, when the storm hit, um, and entire houses were lost. Um, the water services were popped, and so we had water services. It would have been very nice um, if a surrounding or a neighboring utility could have sent in a crew with a work truck 
people that are highly trained, people that have their certifications, and we would have been able, they would have been able to assist us to go around and to, uh, to recover that much faster. Uh, what we ha what I presented to you are the uh, membership applications for both both of these organizations. No additional funds are required. I would just ask that you would allow us to join these organizations. Uh, one thing of note: North Carolina Water Warren actually they have a person who is. Um, in the North Carolina Emergency Management um, EOC when it's um, operational in Raleigh, so that they are right there at the heart of it. Uh, so they would be able to respond if we needed assistance or if other utilities needed assistance. And again, this is strictly voluntary. Motion if, if to approve. Things were needed here. <coughs> Is there an associated cost to this? Very minimal. EWWN has, I think it's like a $75 fee. Uh, they also offer continuing ed classes that employees would be able to go to throughout the year, so it helps to cover some of those costs. I have a motion by Commissioner Langley. Second. And a second by Commissioner Buzio. Is there any other questions? If not, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of the uh, agreement, raise your right hand. Uh, I'm not in favor of it. I didn't raise my right hand. Okay. <laughs> Brian, did you? Oh, I'll vote for it. Okay. Those opposed? Six to one. All right. Item number six, uh, Water District One. Yes, Commissioners. This is something that uh, was presented a few months ago. Uh, this is a safety project that was identified as a need in the water department. We currently utilize gas chlorine as a disinfection method for the water system. Due to safety concerns, uh, we investigated the possibility of uh, receiving funding to convert from gas chlorine to liquid chlorine. Um, and we were extremely blessed uh, that we did receive quite a bit of funding uh, from the North Carolina uh, state agency regarding this. Uh, the next is District 1, <coughs> District 5, District 6, as well as District 7. These districts are identified because these are the districts where we actually have either booster pump stations or water treatment plants that actually have the facilities where the gas chlorine is used. So, um, all of these applications included going in and making uh, adjustments to the buildings as well as uh, pump pumps and different supply methods that would need to change to convert from a gas chlor gas chlorine to liquid chlorine again looking at and I'm just going to provide you some numbers of all of these together to realize uh, what a true <coughs> blessing it is that we have this there were 32 applicants across the state that submitted for these funds that totaled approximately 56 million dollars of that, they awarded $17 million in grants, and Beaufort County received $3.8 million of that $17 million of grant money. Uh, $39, $39 million of loan money was awarded, and we received two. So looking at the total grant award, Beaufort County was, received grant funds that were 23% of the total of, award that was awarded across the entire state. So uh, for fund, a grant funding level of that for a safety project um, is, is, is really a good thing. So we're very excited for that. Uh, the first item on your agenda is District 1. District 1 um, has a grant of $101,100 and a loan of $133,700. Again, remember that is a 20-year loan at 0% interest. So that would be a total debt service that we would pay back of just over $6,000 per year. Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Langley. Second, second by Commissioner uh, Brand. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. It was unanimous. Uh, you want to go to the next one? Yes, sir. That would be District 4, uh, the Bath Township. Again, that's a... Uh, Funding package of 733500 in grant, 244500 in 0% loan for a 20-year term. Okay. And that, all right. Got a motion by Commissioner Langley. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Brin. All those, any, all those in favor? No discussion? I hope right. no. <laughs> all right. <coughs> Unanimous. <laughs> you want to go to no. the next one? Why don't, you, why don't you just go right to the dollar, man? Do all of them. District 5, uh, 
401,100 in grant, 133,700 in 20-year uh, loan. Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Langley. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Evans. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. <laughs> your next one. District 6, 1,115,000 grant and 1,115,000 loan at 0% 20-year. Any questions? So moved. All right, second. got a motion by Commissioner Brown and second by Buzzio. By Buzzio. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Yeah, those opposed? Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> All right. And District 7, uh, 504,000 grant and 168,000 dollars. Oh, Lordy. Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Langley. Second. Sorry. Second by Commissioner Evans. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. <laughs> We've done them fairly fast. Did we get them all in? Yes, sir. Yeah, you got Thank them you all in. Thank you very much. You, you got and, them uh, in. I, I'm not sure who's responsible for doing all the paperwork, but this is a real. I do. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real hit. <laughs> Thank you, you guys are smiling. Thank I'd, you. I'd smile too. All right, we're down to item number 11. <laughs> The removal of the driver's license requirement at the tax collector's office. Commissioner Evans. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, it um, I had a couple of complaints about uh, going in and to pay some folks paying their back tax bill, and I kind of kind of hit me the wrong way because people were trying to pay early, but they had to show their driving license. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. You can mail it in. You can put it in a drop box. But if you show up in person, that's what you got to do. But um, it's it's really it, it doesn't seem to be a big issue. My understanding that it's only like fifty that's come back out of fifty-five thousand. But however, I've gained, uh, gained a little more information tonight from the county manager that it may be legally and by statute um, that we still need to have the driver's license presented when you are paying your bill. That. Yes. Okay. Um, Ryan. Again, this was a. It's my understanding this was a policy that was put in place by the board several several years ago. Um, and and what they do is they ask for when you present the check, they ask for your driver's license or, or confirm that that's your your check. Um, part of the criminal statute for uh, prima facie evidence of you being the person that tried to pass a fraudulent check is that you were identified if you were the check passer. Um, there's a separate section that addresses the prima facie evidence if it's mailed or if it's in a drop box. There's a different section. Um, I am not an attorney, so what I did, the next best thing I could, I called the DA and I said, this is going to be on the agenda. What are your thoughts? Uh, would it hinder your ability to prosecute a case? Um, he said, I need to go back and review the statute. He said, but what I would say to you is anything that you can do to try to, el to keep, um, eliminate somebody from passing a bad check or, or being able to identify them, I would, I would recommend to the board that they leave that in there. So that was his recommendation. But, sure. and, and Commissioner Evans and I had that, had that conversation as well prior. So I'd like to remove that uh, item at this time, please. All right. Anybody got a problem with that? No, All right. That we'll remove that item. All right, we're down to uh, item number 14, the Hospital Authority Board Information. 12. Pardon? 12. 12. I'm sorry. I'm, excuse me. Uh, reporting policy for the purchase orders, uh, Commissioner Richardson. The, uh, on this, I'll try to make this as brief as I can. All I want you to do is to roll over the unfilled purchase orders and the amounts when you do the budget and report it to the commissioners because that's money that in theory would come out. You may have appropriated a year before, but it's going to reduce the fund balance, maybe by just a few hundred thousand dollars, but there should be some big purchase orders in there. Right. How about this? How about we report to you at the end of the fiscal year what are outstanding? Because like Anita mentioned at the last meeting, some of those may get cleared before the end of the month. And if we were to, if we were to put those in the budget ordinance, just say, well, I this got money, you. we may double dip and we don't Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay. All I want to do is I just want to know. We're, we're happy to do that. It's easy for us to do that. We'll have to do that for you. Okay. 
All right, now we'll go to item number 14, the Hospital Authority Board Information, Commissioner Richardson. Well, we, we've asked Commissioner Buzzy over this several times, and he keeps dragging his feet. It was a year ago that we asked for it the last time, and we still don't have any answers. Uh, I'm looking for my stuff here in the book. Six months ago. Sir? Page, page 84. Ago. 84. Well, what I'm, what I'm asking for is that the hospital board present copies of the most recent bank statements to the commissioners. And Commissioner Buzio, is, is that a problem? I'll bring it up at my board meeting in October. Sir, it's not up to your board meeting. It becomes public information when the board gets it. It is public information. Don't forget, I was the chairman of this board. I do know how it operates. And when it becomes public information, you can present it to the county commissioners or to the whole public. What You're subject to the open meetings law. So why are you dragging your feet? Uh, Commissioner uh, Richardson, how about, how about go ahead and talk in, about number two and number three and then let uh, the chairman address both of them, or all three of them. Uh, require the hospital authority board to report on the recovery of approximately $300,000 of the $1.8 million that was paid a year ago for the... Um, uh, I guess the best thing to do is call it the era in Medicare Medicaid billing uh, Vidant Hospital collected some of that money and my question is have, have you asked Vidant to repay that money to the board all right the last one is require the hospital authority board to produce the audit that was supposed to be completed approximately one year ago okay Commissioner uh, Buzzio yes Mr. Chairman uh, on item number one, uh, the board, as of uh, at the end of uh, August 31st, is holding 4.5 million dollars, 4 million uh, cents. So about 4.55 million dollars. On uh, issue number two. Uh, let me explain that so the public understands that. During the period of a period of three or four months in 2011, uh, before the acquisition of Beaufort Hospital by Viden, uh, Beaufort Hospital was submitting bills to Palmetto, which is a billing agency for, uh, for the government, and they were making the right uh, uh, codes. They were putting the right codes in. And Palmetto <coughs> transposed the codes. So for that period of time, approximately $1.8 million was paid to the hospital. Probably kept them afloat because they were on the verge of bankruptcy. Well, they probably were on the verge of bankruptcy. And if I hadn't acquired them, they would have closed. Um, <coughs> so about a year ago, two years ago, uh, they finally caught up with it. They advised us that that had happened. And we went ahead and paid $1.8 million. Uh, any discussions with Biden are being handled by our attorneys and uh, on advice of our attorneys that information until the issue is settled will not be made public uh, those have been only discussed in closed sessions hold on I want to answer that when you finish you answer anything on the uh, audit on the review financial review the last financial review of the hospital authority was done when mr. Richardson the Commissioner Richardson excuse me was chairman and that was for the period of September 1st 2011 through August 4 2015 and the report was provided to the board uh, authority uh, shortly after that uh, I have with my CFO or the hospital authority not the one for the county have reached out to the same certified public accountants which is Russell Jones and Griffith and I don't have board approval yet and our meeting will be in, in October uh, the board hopefully will approve us signing a contract and I basically verbally accepted it based upon approval of and I told them that approval of the uh, hospital authority board for the period of August 5th opening of business 2015 to the date of our meeting of October uh, at least the 23rd I have to look at <coughs> October 23rd yeah, I'll tell you right in a second <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, October 25th. It will go to uh, the date of October 25th. Where is that going to be? Uh, it's here. Uh, so that's when the, uh, at that point, the board will approve that and the re financial review will be done the same way it was done on, on the 15th. Uh, so those are the uh, three issues that I've responded to. Going back to item number one, how many bank accounts are included in that $4.8 million? One. Same bank account that you that No, you there's were, two bank accounts. Yeah, there is another bank account which That's is right. uh, controlled, yes. All right, how much money is in that bank About account? About 100000 100000 mm -hmm. All right. The... Uh, you know, this is a this is a request again in public that the commissioners be presented with those bank statements. They are a separate hospital authority, number one, separate board of this from this board, and anything that we release is is a bond they approve, not my approval, the approval of the hospital authority board. The same way in that it was done, and you know this when you were chairman of that board. I don't have the authority to release anything without the vote of the board. But. And in, in case it has to do with legal issues, it has to be an approval. Are you subject to the open meetings law? Certainly we are. Okay. The then meeting is open. It's published. Do, to, all, to of the, do all of the members of the board get a copy of the bank statements? Correct. Then the bank statements become public information. They get them at the board meeting. They're, they're public information. There's no reason why the commissioners can't have it. And well, I really don't understand why me. you don't want us to have Mr. it. Mr. Chairman, the last request we got on a FOI request, our attorneys handled that. And they said it had to be released under an FOI. I'm sorry, but the attorneys are wrong. I know that attorney. That's right. I forgot you're an attorney. I, 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 I've been around the block a few times. So, uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll be taking care of this in a different manner. Good. Do that. Required, uh, the, the hospital board on the recovery of the $300,000. Now, what happened when that when the we, we gave the hospital to Vidant was Vidant kept collecting money that should have come to the trust fund. Vida has never turned one dime of that money over You're to right. the hospital board without the hospital board making a demand for the money. And my question to you is real plain. Have you asked Vida to return the money that belongs to the county? The Vida has, when, when money that they have received has been turned over to the hospital authority board. This issue is in the hands of the attorneys. I am not at liberty That's to just discuss this. Use, has the board taken action to demand the return of the money that belongs to the taxpayers of Beaufort County in the amount of approximately three hundred thousand dollars? And it's a yes or no. It's not a yes or no. It's has the board motion. voted? No, the board hasn't voted because you, as chairman, are derelict in your duties in getting our money. You know, it's just that simple. You're big buddies with Vida, and you couldn't possibly ask them to do the right thing. If okay. it wasn't for Biden, that hospital would be closed and the residents That's not what we're discussing. We're discussing your honesty. You want to say that again? Yeah. So it gets in a minute. Oh, I want it in a minute. Uh, are you You're not doing you your job as chairman of that hospital board in protecting the no, taxpayers of this county. Are you saying I'm dishonest? I'm saying that it is honest to ask people to pay their no, honest did, debts. That's what I'm say saying. I was dishonest. I gentlemen, said you're gentlemen, being dishonest gentlemen. when you don't do your fiduciary duty that's yeah. in the law that's your fiduciary duty we we there is a scheduled board meeting for October the 25th and uh, 23rd 25th. the board 25th. had that over a year there uh, no issues to discuss and it hasn't been a year the issues have been there I made these requests a year ago at an April meeting I've got a copy of it right here with me does anyone else have any questions I haven't finished yet third item I have not addressed of the audit. You promised sitting in that very chair a year ago that we were going to have an audit within a matter of a few months. That was a year ago and we still don't have an audit. It's not an audit, it's a financial review. Whatever you want to call it. Do you know what an audit is? Anything you want to call it. An audit's not very much these days. The, the, the review was is scheduled to be done once <coughs> The board gives the approval to do it, but the board has discussed it, but it's not been approved yet to do to do the review, just like it was done before. Well, why don't you want to do an audit or a review or whatever you want to call well, it? I, We're doing a review. I think uh, I think the board will approve doing the review. You we said discussed the same thing it. We just a year haven't. Ago. Huh? You said you guys said the same thing a year ago. Well, I think the approach has been taken is that we wanted to wait until we had all of the issues solved or resolved before we did the final review. 
Okay. Well, I'm still waiting. All right. Just be patient. Just be patient. Uh, any anyone else have any comment on it? No. All right. We'll move to item number 15, the partnership for the signs lease agreement. Uh, Brian, I guess you're up. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. As you'll recall at your September the 5th regular meeting, the board received and reviewed the lease agreement for the partnership of the Sounds property. This is where the North Carolina, North Carolina Estuarium is located. It's jointly owned property between the city and the county. Uh, at its regular meeting on September 11th, the city council unanimously adopted a resolution with, which authorized the lease. You, you need to do the same thing. You have attached a resolution which finds the property to be surplus to the county's needs for the term of the lease and approves the lease agreement. Um, so this, again, this is not something you haven't seen before, but the resolution is new. The resolution just says that you find that property to be surplus during the term of the lease and that you're authorized us to execute the <coughs> motion to approve. Got a motion by Commissioner Sorry. Langley, second by Commissioner Brian. Any questions of Brian? All those in favor of the agreement, raise your right hand or the lease. Vote was unanimous. I couldn't see, did you? Yeah. All, right. All right, we're down to Item number 16, the uh, fiscal year end 17 18 financing package collateral and advance projects. Uh, Brian? Yes, sir. At, as we discussed at the Finance Committee meeting that was recently held, um, the, the committee reviewed the proposed $3 million capital financing package. Um, Again, that financing is a 10-year term secured by asset collateral, which simply means the asset to be improved or purchased serves as a collateral for the financing. Um, because there's $3 million proposed in borrowing, you, you need collateral in at least that amount to be able to borrow. And in an effort to not use multiple buildings, um, the Finance Committee discussed and recommended using the, the, the courthouse as the asset collateral since a large amount of the work to be done in <coughs> and of course you have to use one of the facilities that you're doing work on um, they further discussed the committee further discussed uh, what certain dollar amount of projects you may want to do as uh, as reimbursement projects before you get final LGC approval um, you currently have a, res uh, a reimbursement resolution in place that allows you to do that the committee recommended authorizing up to five hundred thousand uh, dollars in financing prior to LGC approval, which we anticipate in January at their meeting in January. Um, the committee further recommended funding the school soccer facility land purchase as one of those reimbursement projects, with the remaining projects to be determined by staff based on priority and ability to complete within that five hundred thousand dollar total limit. Um, again, selected projects, any that were selected based on that criteria would still have to come back to the board for final approval. So it's not the last time you'll see it. Um, so out of that, the recommendation is that you approve using the courthouse as the asset collateral for the $3 million FY1718 capital project financing uh, package and authorizing a half million dollars as the amount available for advanced projects and approve proceeding with the school soccer facility land purchase in the amount of $80,000 as one of those advanced projects. So moved. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Second. Okay, got a motion by uh, Commissioner Brent, a second by Question. Commissioner Buzio. Question. All right. How much land are we talking about on the soccer field? I think it's uh, 10 acres. Yes, yeah, either 10 or 11 acres. I've sorry. heard all kind of numbers, three, five, eight. I just, I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'd, I'd like to see them, it amended, uh, whatever we need to do to have this, this property appraised. Well, it really don't matter what it appraises for, Jerry, it's what the man's asking for. Here like we go that. again. I'd like to see the property appraised. I have appraisal done on it. The, the question, the appraisal is a state statute requirement, right? Is that um, or not? Not necessarily. Nope. I mean, I don't think you necessarily have to do that, but I mean, it's always a good practice. I think. Okay. That way, you know what you're doing. And and that's probably. And I'm not sure, not sure whether that was part of what the school had planned to do anyway. I can talk with Dr. Phipps about that. We're just looking at whether that's a project that you're going to move forward with. I know they're going to do a phase one on it. I know they got to get it surveyed. They got to do a few things to be able to do all that. They so. got to get a environmental yeah. study on it too. Yeah. Right. That, that's the phase one, yes, sir. Why don't they use the empty soccer fields up at the airport? I mean, you know, here we are. They won't, they, they won't let you do that. Oh, who won't let them do it? The city. 
Really? Because they won't let the school use no, them? Well, first off, they're not full-size soccer fields. So what's that got to do with anything? There is no full-size soccer field, by the way. Not here in Beaufort County. Well, there's not a full-size the soccer field. That's the reason our soccer team got beat when we went to the state championship, because we had to play on a full-size soccer field. If I may respond to that, I happen to be doing a set of plans for a soccer complex over in Greenville, and there is no statutory standard size of soccer field so you're not you're saying it's not a hundred yards like a football field. no no it's not there's different sizes there's all different sizes 75 yards wide and 125 yards deep that's what you say but that there's is, other that sizes is, that is a, but when, when we go when we go upstate to play play for championships we play on their full-size soccer field okay well uh, now, I still think we should find out whether they can use those fields at, uh, over at the uh, up, up at the center simply because it's plenty big enough that you could lay off whatever size soccer field that you wanted up there to play on. That's the way that place is laid out. And that complex is not used during the daytime when school is in session during the week. There's nobody up there. So why are we spending $80,000 plus probably another $80,000 before it's all over with? Because all we're, all we're talking about is the money to buy the land right now. But the truth of the matter is when this project is over with, it's going to cost the taxpayers at least a quarter of a million dollars let me, let me tell you to where, get where we need to go. Mr. Chairman, let yes. me tell you where, where the school system and, and uh, the uh, Pampack Booster Club is at. They've already raised, I, uh, I think it's about $40,000 $40, to put into the soccer field. They've got donations to have the, the soccer field uh, cleared. Uh, they've uh, got people interested in giving large donations to, to uh, the school system for lighting, uh, uh, preparation of the field. So. They can go to work on it right now. They're ready to go to work on that soccer field. All we got, but they, nobody's gonna gonna start anything until we own until we own the property. Okay, Commissioner Buzzio. This property is, it joins the school, correct? Yes. So it's right there on school property. Well, it's, it's right there. On school right, right. Uh, you ride right by when you go to the uh, field house. Okay. I'd like to make a motion on it. Well, we've got, we've got a motion in the second. Oh, okay. We're discussing. I got a we're, we're in the discussion. I got a question. Yes. Brian, I know, <clears throat> Mr. Brian, I understand that you said that it's a possibility that, that we get these this $3 million in January. Is there a possibility that we don't get it? Um, the $3 million loan. I mean, I guess there's always that possibility. So if we, if we front this $500,000 prior to getting this prior to getting the loan and it falls through, where does that 500000 come from? You would draw that out of fund balance. Oh, no. And, and that, was, that was the discussion the Finance Committee had was, you know, how far, how far are you willing to go out and before you get a final approval? Um, what LGC has told us is, um, again, Tim Romaki said, local governments are financing these kind of projects every day and we're approving them every day and that it is an appropriate use of financing and local governments, it's their decision on how they pay for projects, whether they pay as you go, whether they draw down fund balance or whether they finance. It was not their um, intent. So I can't give you 100%. I mean, I obviously can't do that because there's a board, the local government decision has to vote on it. Um, but but the man who's in charge of, their, of, that, of that debt financing section said, we see this every day and we approve this every day. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to put all three of these in the same motion. Is there any more discussion before we take a vote? Well, I'd like some clarification uh, on what we're voting on. Okay. Would you like to? Yes, sir. And I'll be glad. We'll be glad to break them out. We just put them together. Um, that that first of all, in the three million dollar cloud, the, the application that we set forth, or we back up, not the application. Uh, in the in the financing bids that we put out in the request for bids that we put out for financing institutions we've got to show them what collateral we're going to put up for that three million dollar loan um, the finance committee recommended that we use the courthouse as that collateral um, that facility is valued on our books at about five million dollars um, 
um, otherwise you would need to use a, a couple of buildings um, because that is one of the structures that is um, a part of the, the construction project a heavy piece of that construction project it's appropriate to use that um, and what we wouldn't want to do is use use multiple ones um, just for, for for simplicity and being able to deal with the banks um, so that's the first piece of it is to say yes that's what we're going to say in the bid in the request for proposals for financing bids from banks that the collateral will be the courthouse um, then the second piece would be that um, you would authorize us to move forward with up to five hundred thousand dollars worth of approved projects that you've approved in this um, for a, for refunding before the LGC gives final approval of the loan um, and then that the last piece is of that 500,000 80,000 of it would be this soccer complex project happy to do you are you going to do an appraisal of the of the land or are you just going to go out and do what you've been doing paying people what they want I mean, I don't see where appraisal matters anything. You paid them three times what, what it appraised for the land at the community college. You paid $50,000 an acre for a slimes pond down at Wrights Creek. So, I, I mean, I, appraisals are basically useless with this group. Well, the, the appraisal at Wrights Creek uh, was in excess of what the county paid. Uh, and it was in the uh, what we paid uh, or the appraisal in the first bank was more than what the purchase price was the community college property that sh that was true that was uh, that payment was more than the appraised value and, it, and, and Wrights Creek was a farce there was no bank involved in two of those loans so when there's not a bank involved to control the faucet on the money appraisals go can go anywhere you want them to go and well we've, what we've had the state auditor's office come in here and they spent two different trips with two different people and they've they've gone through all the information and they've interviewed every commissioner and they said that there was nothing there so what they told you was your bookkeeping was accurate no that's really no, all you they didn't said they didn't they didn't, they didn't tell you that there's something he <coughs> didn't go on they told you your bookkeeping was accurate yeah that's why audits aren't worth anything Okay. All right. Would you, would you be willing to enter to change the motion and we do them one at a time? I, I say we much them together. Yeah. Okay. All right. We got a motion, and we've got a second uh, to do all three things. That involves the collateral. It involves the amount of money that we're willing to spend up front before we get the LG. Uh, it's approval and then uh, the approval of 80,000 to purchase the land for the soccer field. That's in that 500,000. Yeah, that's in the 500,000. That's in the 500,000. Yeah. Now it's still, but that's still subject to all the guidelines that the school board and the, and the county has to go by on the purchase. You're going to pay four or five thousand a year to keep up the soccer field after you get it. You're just adding burden on taxpayers. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Is yours up, Jerry? No. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Those opposed? Two. So the vote's five to two. All right. We're down to the solid, I mean solid, the solar uh, farm moratorium. And we've been we've been asked to change our terminology to solar facility. Uh, David, we can certainly do that. Change to solar facility. I think we all, all we need to do at this point, if 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 you would mind to do uh, this, is to put this on for a public hearing again on November six, which would be. Our meeting that'll that'll be our second public hearing that we are required to do because uh, you have put this uh, for one year so it's more than 60 days we're required to have two public hearings that'll be the second do we need a motion to proceed with with this so. we're, we're not approving the moratorium no. okay 
So. You're, you're in essence approving it in this format, subject to what you just right. said to change the, the word from um, to facility, which we can do. Okay. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Buzio. Second. Second by Commissioner Brin. Uh, all those in favor of moving forward, raise your right hand. Vote was unanimous. Okay. Uh, we're down to item number 18, the bid offer to purchase property in Bellhaven. That's you, David. Yes. Uh, we have a number of uh, bids on Cali county property. These are, uh, I think all of these are um, uh, foreclosures for taxes. Uh, the first in your book, or on page 109, are three offers uh, from Robin Banks. Mr. Banks has previously uh, bought property from the county in past years, um, but not since I've been the county attorney. Anyway, uh, he's made these three offers. You see the addresses. Uh, 641 West Pine Bellhaven, Pine Street Bellhaven, 412 Railroad Street Bellhaven. Uh, he's offered the amount of $100 uh, per uh, uh, parcel of those three, and he has made a 5% deposit uh, that I am holding uh, for the county. Okay, you've heard the, uh, the report on the bids. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Brin. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Richardson. Any any further discussion? If not, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of taking the offer, raise your right hand. <laughs> is that unanimous? Yep. I was getting like a clerk. All right, you want to go to the next one? Uh, yes, uh, David. page 119, there are, um, well, actually, we've got 16 on that list. I'm sorry, 17 on that list. Um, oh, and we have taken off uh, about halfway down. There's, you see Highway 32, Long Acre Township. I apologize for the misspelling of Long Acre. I do know how to spell it. Uh, but Highway 32, uh, we sold that at, I think it was the last meeting or uh, two meetings ago to Mr. Peel. So that, that one has already been sold. We have to take that off the list. If you slide down to uh, Wright Creek, uh, which would be Wright's Creek Road, Bath Township, then Possum Hill Road, Bath Township, and Old County Road, Pantigo uh, Township, we are removing those three, uh, or I'm asking you to remove them. They're all three uh, FEMA properties that we can't sell, uh, so uh, or that the county is prohibited from selling. David, I'm, excuse me, I missed the first one that you said. Uh, at the top was Highway 32, about halfway down Long Acre Township. Yeah, I, I got the other two. I thought we could sell them subject to the FEMA restrictions. You, you can transfer them to a conservation group, mm -hmm. but you can't sell them. Lord help us. We don't need to do any more of that stuff. This one here is about? Yeah. yeah. All right, so you end up with 13, uh, 13 parcels. I have deposits on those 13. You see what he's offered uh, is $50 per parcel uh, for each one of those. The detail... Um, is is behind it and that is uh, we've done business with these folks before it's coast to coast group LLC out of Winterville any any questions okay entertain a motion to approve the offer Someone? got a motion by Commissioner Buzio is there a second 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 by Commissioner Richardson uh, any Discussions, comments? If not, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of accepting the offer, raise your right hand. All those opposed, I want to make sure. Okay. It was unanimous. All right. We're down to item number 20, the CenturyLink uh, easement agreement. Brian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, I apologize for walking this one in. Occasionally, we get items that come in at last minute and, and having only one day being a month. 
sometimes causes us to have to walk some things in, so I apologize for that. We had to give it to you ahead of time. But this is a easement agreement with CenturyLink uh, for them to install a fiber optic line for the USDA office at the Farm Services Building. Um, USDA is putting that line in for their use. It's not costing us anything, but but uh, CenturyLink needs the easement to be able to do that. Um, they're also they're also getting an easement from the city to come up at Airport Road. The only easement they need from the county is when they cross over onto county-owned property where uh, the Farm Service Building is located. So move. Okay, got a motion by Commissioner uh, uh, Booth. Is there second. a second? Second by Commissioner Brin. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed. Mm -hmm. I'm with boy. You're for it. <coughs> okay, you got that, Katie. Unanimous. All right, we're down to item number 21. This is on the military air uh, air right, uh, Commissioner Richardson. Well, I, you know, I think that just as information to property owners in the county, the military is back playing their game trying to get control of air rights however they can. They've, they have tried several different tricks uh, since the OLF was defeated. And uh, the last one was a one mile strip that started in Jacksonville and went to Wake County and all the way back down on the north end of the bombing range. And all they were trying to do was establish the price for air rights over this property. They would then have used the takings law in the U.S. Constitution to take whatever they needed and wrote you a check for it, and that would have been the end of it. So they're back. Uh, I, my message to farmers and property owners is I know in the past it was a matter of going down to the uh, uh, cooperative extension office and signing the paperwork, and they'd send you a check. Please don't do that this way. Read the contract that you're going to be signing because it's going to have to be notarized. The last contract that was presented to property owners said very specifically in there, this contract can be enforced by the U.S. Navy. Okay. Now they're saying it can be enforced by the U.S. Air Force is my understanding. But there, there's, there is a memorandum of understanding that we found when we did the OLF stuff between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Defense. Now, I have a copy of it in my office. If you give me a month, I can find it. But it's an important memorandum of understanding because what it says is the Defense Department will provide the money and the USDA will go out and get the leases and the agreements to acquire whatever rights the Defense Department wants. So why are they using the USDA? Because the USDA is a respected organization among farmers and big property owners, and they need somebody that looks good to put in front of them. So uh, to the public, to those of you out there in TV land that are watching this, be careful with these agreements. We do not, you do not need to be giving up your air rights for a small amount of money. All they want to do is get their hooks into you. Once they establish prices, then they can take anything they want. And once again, there is a hearing tonight. I, I can say a hearing. It's an informational meeting tonight, and there will be one tomorrow night in Columbia. So, all right, we're down to the last item, uh, the uh, property at 1240 Cal Farm Road here in Washington. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> commissioners, you may recall, uh, I think it was last meeting we discussed this. There are three parcels of land uh, that Beaufort County owns uh, that has been leased to Biden Hospital. Uh, one of those parcels of land is 1240 Cal Farm Road, which is, I, I refer to this as at the top of the hill. If you go down Brown Street, about as far as you got, go before you get to where the helicopters land, uh, for the hospital, you make a left turn. Um, it's the beach looking house that sits back in there. It used to be, uh, I think, Dr. Alligood's uh, the dermatologist. Dermatology. The sign is still out, out front. Um, and we agreed uh, at that meeting, you agreed at that meeting, uh, to try to sell these uh, two of these three pieces of property. Um, and to split uh, any uh, funds received as a result of, of that sale. So we've been uh, trying to, to do that. 
I received this afternoon an offer uh, on the property at 1240 Cal Farm Road, which is that property I just spoke to you about. Um, the offer was for $15,750. Uh, I have a 5% deposit on that offer, uh, check $787.50. Uh, <clears throat> I have run that offer by the attorney uh, for Vident Hospital, and uh, he, he is okay. He said he would be okay. As you know, what they have done, they have... Uh, submitted an offer like we've done these in the past just like we did on these foreclosures uh, but they've submitted this this will be if acceptable by you it will be run in the paper one time for 10 days for any upset bid uh, of this bid for 15750 uh, I want to disclose to you make sure that you understand that what the offer is to the land value only $15,750. There is a building on that property, uh, which is the building that I referred to, uh, which has a value on the tax books of $107,139. That's exclusive of the land value. So they are all making an offer of the land value of $15,750. Um, it, Have they uh, made any um, any comments on what they're going to do with the with the uh, building itself? Yes, they they, they, they they anticipate that they may be tearing the building down. Uh, it has uh, some problems. It has termites and it has some water damage. Um, this this building was built around 1970, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It's, it's been there a while. And uh, what, what they're offering to do is to whatever they do to it, if they're able to rehab it, fine. If they can't tear it down, they're going to build something else there. But they're going to put um, a podiatry office, as I understand it, uh, will be at, at that location. So it'll go back on the tax, tax records. But we've, we've not had any kind of an inspection made of the building no. inside and out. No. Brian and I have both looked at it in the sense that we've we've looked over there, looked at it, you know. But uh, we've, it, we've it, not done it's right a, it's right adjacent to the apartment complex where my mother lives. Uh, my mother-in-law. Yes. I've I've not been inside of it. Yeah. No. Uh, How long has it been vacant? A lifetime. Oh, uh, it's been quite. It's probably quite ten years. years. Yeah. Still, the, the roof's not in building. good shape on it. Um, it can, uh, you know, it can be rehabbed. As a commissioner, you know, I understand it's not worth what it's on the tax books for the hundred seventeen thousand, as far as the structure itself goes. But just speaking for Hood, I, you know, I wouldn't entertain an offer of less than forty thousand dollars. You know, I, I would, I would be willing to vote for that. But I, I can't for this. I, I my biggest problem is we've not had anybody look at the inside and give us some, uh, you know, well, estimate. I, I, I know they have. Uh, they're here tonight. If you'd like to uh, hear from them, they've had somebody look at the inside. I've just explained to them that it's not my job to sell this one way or the other. I'm just laying it out to you and let, let you make the decision. So uh, they – they volunteered to come and answer any questions. Would you? Would one of you or both of you? <coughs> you might come into the podium. Do you, <laughs> would you? Would you like to tell us you've been so, in it? I'm yes, assuming it and everything. Um, several times, we've had Terminex come and give a report. Could you pull that mic a little closer to you? We've had Terminex come. Uh, and gave us a report. There's termites in every room. The all the windows leak. I've had AR Chesson come out there, give us an estimate. We were we're looking at this property. We thought we would rehab it, and the more we dig into it, the worse shape. Unfortunately, we're finding. Um, they think it was a modular built back in '72. Rot is throughout the building. 
um, again, we were hoping it was going to be a rehab. Initially, we wanted to change the roof line so that I could have just a bit more space, but still within that same footprint in order to use the curb and gutter that's there. Um, but because um, of the nature of the building and it being modular, um, they're not sure the, how much it can be expanded. Um, the other issue is that if we did replace all of the windows, the where the two pieces come together, there's not a lot of flashing, and so it will be a, an ongoing problem of leakage. <coughs> this this is not a brick structure. This no, is a wood. No, sir. No, it's, it's, it's a not. modular unit that okay. was brought in. Um, we also got an estimate to if we were to have the building demolished. Um, what was it, 16? A little over $16,000. From B.E. Singleton. tear it down and completely, re completely remove it. We're looking to replace it with about a 2,000 square foot modern office building. So you're you're looking at the cost of the lot of the 15 plus another 16 to we're, demolish it. We're already it. at a loss. That's right. So you're, the, the demo is more than tax value on the lot itself. So you would have 30,000 plus over, in over it. That's right. Before we even mm. lay the first brick. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, had, did y'all get a price on rehabbing the building? Well, from what Chesson is saying, that it's probably not structurally sound to do that. Uh, if you go in there, every room has has there's a lot water of damage. There's a there's a lot of damage in there. Significant rot. That was our intention to to rehab any, it. Any mold that you saw? Yes. Up throughout. And like I said, Terminex was just there last uh, Thursday and gave us a report. Termites in every room. So, any anybody have a question or a comment? Do you mind? It? I don't think you introduced yourself. I'm sorry, David Ainsley. Sorry, Ainsley Resevelin. This is my husband, David Resevelin. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. All the Thank commissioners. You. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Yeah. Any if there's questions? no other questions, or uh, then we'll. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I make a motion that we uh, we move to uh, to let them purchase the land. At the offer. At the offer. Okay. We got a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any any discussion? Just to clarify, Mr. Chairman, it's not a purchase. It's a start the upset offer. Yes. Okay. I'm, you correct me at every meeting. <laughs> no, right. He's right. And we're aware of that yeah, as well. I, okay. So it will it will be publicized for an upset bid. Any other questions before we take a vote? All right. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All right. All those opposed. I just I'm just making sure. Okay. Oh, it was unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'm going to bring So move. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. To adjourn. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, second. second. All right. All those in favor, raise your right hand.